Good evening. My name is Michael Goodson, and I'm the senior curator and director of programs at the Contemporary Bayview. And tonight, uh, I'm in conversation with Adili Donald Odisha, uh, who has an exhibition called uh, Three Steps from Center in the Gallery currently. Um, and we are actually holding this conversation in front of a mural that was, uh, it's a site piece of the mural that was executed um, here in the gallery. We're also showing uh, four poses, most of them recent. Um, there's a few people I'd love to thank before we uh, begin this conversation. Um, uh, everyone who has sponsored the show, and in particular, uh, Ron Tagudi, who uh, both is supporting the show and uh, the Peru Collection, and who is supporting the show and has uh, loaned two very important works, two very important paintings for this exhibition. Um, uh, and, I, and I'll start actually um, with the, the choice of your biography, which is an interesting one, in my opinion. Uh, you were born in Nigeria in 1956, and, uh, but immigrated with your family, and your father was actually uh, one of the preeminent and first Africanist scholars uh, in America, as I understand it. Yeah, he was a, he was the first black Africanist in the United States. Yeah, and, and, he, and he wasn't the first Africanist uh, okay. by Roy Siegel. He, he was the second one. And your, your experience was, I think you said that you had moved here when you were four? It actually, uh, four years old in the Midwest, but I moved here when I was six and so uh, that was the start of the gap year there. Okay. And then moved around a little bit, but settled more or less in, uh, in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, and I believe around four, maybe six, but I moved around. Where your father was, in fact, a, 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 a professor. Yes, yes, at Ohio State. And your undergraduate degree was from Ohio State University. Right, right. Um, uh, the, the list, your uh, uh, resume is actually incredible. It shows at the Savannah College of Art and Design, uh, the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, uh, and the, the Ulrich Museum, uh, at Wichita State University, the Miami Art Museum, and really most interesting to me, you were the, one of the premier shows, if not the premier show at the City Museum of Harlem in 96. Right, well, my exhibition uh, uh, opened up the project space that they have at the Contemporary Art Gallery. Uh, so that was really a, a great thing um, to do and to work. It's, it's a unique sort of experience to pay for work. There were some issues with the drawing, uh, but we resolved those and I was able to do some great work with that. Yeah, it's one that I know actually through photographs. And I think what's interesting about that is that uh, my encounters with your work initially were photographic encounters, mm -hmm. which is a, a strange way to see this work because I would argue that you really must be in the room with it to understand it completely. Um, because there, there's a, a kind of implied dimensionality to it that is, is difficult to understand uh, both in a photograph or worse yet at 70 D DPI when you're looking at it on a computer screen. Yeah. It doesn't really translate. Right. Um, but I think the, so I had misconceptions about this work for a, a solid uh, six, seven years, mm -hmm. I think. And then interestingly about, um, maybe four years ago I saw you speak at the Pizzuti Collection in Columbus and that coincided with me having a physical uh, interaction with the work. Right. And it completely changed the way I thought about it. And I was able to actually start finding uh, a point of purchase with all the ideas that are embedded in these uh, formal parts of your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, color, shape, uh, I would argue rhythm, mm -hmm. pattern, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the work started opening up and opening up and opening up. Mm -hmm. And that talk in particular um, opened my mind to all the potential that lies in what people, I think, uh, on first view see as just formal painting, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So uh, yesterday you really eloquently sort of listed uh, the primary potential ideas in what you do. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, color and drawing are very simple things, let's say, um, are, are 
foundational in the work and the way in which I approach drawing is, uh, you know, there's many different aspects to it. Remembering my dad always telling me to draw is um, something that is, uh, it was just an, always an important thing in my early studies, just to draw, to be able to draw and just to draw a lot. Um, it became more important later when I understood the abilities of, uh, and the capabilities of what drawing could create in a space or how it can define space or make space or, you know, just intimate what space can become. But um, you, were, you said a lot of things. I want to say that um, for myself, it's like I uh, have this experience with my history of making things and making this work and in particular being able to understand how my color and my drawing formed not only from what I said with my father but just from looking at comic books and looking at a lot of movies on television and just being, you know, active and looking at things in the world. Uh, my mother taking me to garage sales and my sense of tactility, my sense of being able to touch things and learn from touching and being with things. And that comes with these paintings. Like most, in fact, like all art, you really need to be able to see it in person, to be able to understand what you're seeing and know what it is, what it looks like, what it might feel like, what it, what it, the tactility of it that you see as you look at it and if you're able to touch it as you touch it. Um, even smell and things like that can be a really important aspect to the work that you're experiencing in front of you. And in particular with my paintings, it's very important to understand the tactility of the paint, the nature of the paint. I mean, you're seeing it as a digital image and it may be the problem of the dig digital as much as the, uh, the way that it creates access. It maybe denies the sense of that physicality that you have if you're standing in front of it. So with the wood panels here or the canvas paintings in the other room, the canvas painting in the other room, and even here with the wall painting, there's a specific tactility that happens that's not only with the material on the wall or a canvas or wood panel, but the tactility of the color that's coming and emanating off of the wall. There's a physicality that I'm wanting with the color that I use that creates a certain kind of embodiment of space or embodiment of being. And that is also extremely um, um, relevant in the experience of the work. So I always get a little miffed when I say, hear people say, oh, it's just only formal or, or I know the work because I've seen something like it before. And I know that that's the kind of uh, senselessness of, of, the digital, of the digital world. You know, just only uh, looking and engaging um, through that means rather than understanding that you need the body with the mind right. than just only the mind active. Well, what, what occurs to me is that my f it is um, uh, sort of a fallacy of our time because my first uh, experiences with, uh, say, Howard E. Pendel's work mm -hmm. or uh, Stanley Whitney's work or um, uh, Al Loving's work was actually being in the room with those works. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw them first in museums mm -hmm. um, before seeing, I, I didn't look at them on a computer screen. Right. Or if I didn't see them in a museum, I saw them in a book, which is a, has a kind of physical presence. Um, and, and that was actually, it helped me understand that work, which I think is probably, those artists are probably pretty foundational to the way you think about how a painting is constructed and how um, to how you address space in a painting, which is another thing about your painting that's endlessly fascinating to me. Uh, one of the things I think I might require is it feels a little tyrannical, but one of the things I really want out of abstraction is for space to be dealt with, and you deal with space all the time. Well, it's, it's um, I mean, there's, I come to that notion with from a lot of people. In particular, I'm right now thinking of Stanley Whitney when I think of the way he's talked about space to me. And he was very clear about it with the sense of drawing, as it means you can't have good, he said you can't have good space without good color, but you can't have, I don't think you can have good color without good drawing. And I think that um, they, it all coincides together. There's another artist um, I used to read about when you know I was younger in school, was uh, Bryce Martin wanting to be able to make the mark and color be the same thing. And that's something you see in Ellsworth Kelly primarily uh, and other artists as well, where it's not just say color is an atmospheric quality or color is a 
um, object indicator, but when you have the mark and color exist in the same stroke, in the same moment, um, there's something very profound and immediate about that. And I think for Martin, that he saw that in, in Pollock, and you can see it in a lot of artists from the, you know, Abex artists, in fact, uh, where you're looking at their work and seeing that uh, kind of moment happen. Joe Mitchell, um, I think uh, Clifford Still. But if I, if I were to put my mind to it, I might see it in Rochenko's, you know, final paintings, the last paintings, yep. or I'm gonna see it in the Malevich, in, his, in the black paintings, let's say, or suprematist work, let's say, where you see that it, it, it is an arc of, of, of an idea, but the color and the mark are kind of synonymous, or maybe Kandinsky. I'm gonna see it there in the early Kandinsky work. But, so we, we can kind of go and jump around, and I'm talking only Western painting, because my mind is also going into like, uh, uh, painting in, 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 in Africa, yeah, and painting I, and in I Nigeria. Wanna, I want to talk know, to you about yeah. that too because I think the other thing that has sort of defined your career for many people is this melding of cultures. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I do think it's interesting that the, 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 the spectrum of artists that you just mentioned uh, are often thought of, are, are they're simplified into gestural abstraction. Mm -hmm. And there's something almost selfish about this idea of gesture being the spiritual thing, that can, the vessel that can hold all these ideas. I, I prefer, I, th I see all those artists as very, very intentional mm -hmm. artists. It, I, I think so, but then the, you're going to talk about, I'm going to think about the intentionality of Stuart Davis, who I right. really love looking at. And there's hardly, I mean, there's the gesture of humanity in the sense of being a human being, in the sense of taking brush from the palette, moving the brush to the canvas, putting the brush down, or the same thing to a wall. They're gonna have the intention of gesture being visible, but it's not like, say, intentional in the sense of like, oh, I want it to drip, or I want it to be transparent here or there, or I want it to be uh, having my hand movement visible in the sense of, I want that there. Right. So there is, um, you know, it's art school, has a lot of responsibilities and there's a lot of failure in art schools in the sense of teaching art to people. It kind of becomes cliched, it kind of becomes standardized, it kind of becomes, uh, oh, art is only like this, everything else is uh, you know, just rubbish, let's say. And they need to be able to understand that there are so many ways of handling paint, so many ways of applying paint, so many ways of depicting an image or a picture or a thing. And when you have an art school that really allows that to happen in the teaching, you're gonna get a lot more variety in as much as a lot more strength of, from students coming out there in the world. So right. I'm always kind of, uh, I teach, I teach at Tyler School of Art and right. I love teaching there. I work with great students there. But it's like, you know, I look around, I travel around and I see, um, you know, a lot of students who have to do what they normally do when you get out of school, reteach re yourself the craft. I think it's interesting that you have this pedagogical element uh, that I think enters the paintings. Uh, I mean, I, I can feel that in the paintings. Mm -hmm. And I can feel that actually in the intentionality of the paintings. Although, I mean, I think we could sort of talk semantically about what intentionality means in painting. Um, I really am talking more about uh, a clearer idea of where the trajectory of your ideas goes as a result of the vocabulary you develop as a painter, uh, which seems like a very, whether you're Fairfield Porter or you, it, it, it feels um, it, like you, you, you know your path even when you're figuring out your path. Well, th that's the thing, you know, you, you kind of have a sense of what it might be, but you really don't know it. I don't think you really know it. I think that's the thing, again, when I come to like the idea of art schools, they look at what's already been made and then they say, that's it. Right. Versus that an artist is, always, if you're really making, if you're really gonna be an artist, you're gonna remake what you know, and you're gonna make it your own thing. And there's no guide for that. You're really gonna have to just take the brave step, I guess, I'll call it that, and remake what you know into something yours. And that is not pictured anywhere, but in your mind and heart. And so that's what's, makes it so hard really because you're just having to work through what you already know, what you already know, what you've been taught, but then your own inner guide, your own inner map, your own inner path towards something that is yours eventually. 
that becomes yours eventually. So that's where it come into, you no, know, that's where my complaint for te in teaching comes in when it's like, okay, this way, but no consideration for anything else. And when you do bring something else new in school, a lot of times you're not given encouragement. And so it's like, uh, you really have to have a, I, I believe it's just having a lot of inner strength, a lot of maybe friends or people that you peer groups that can help give that kind of emotional and psychological and intellectual guidance and, and, and I guess I want to say um, sustenance to go forward. Yeah. yeah. And I think it, it's difficult and, and the indicator of how difficult it is is what I would call a massive attrition of those who make art, say, 10 years out of art school. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you figure out that, you know, it's, it's, it's really not what you are. It's probably part of your life mm -hmm. and part of your understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually would like to touch upon how uh, the, the texture and the olfactory experience of a, of a garage sale, which is such a Midwestern yeah, experience, yeah, yes, yes. has entered this work. Because <laughs> uh, that's just- It was happened. valuable. It, it was so valuable. That's a fascinating idea to yeah, me. And yeah. not one, it's a new idea in this work for me as well. Right, 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 right. Um, and there's nothing I like more than a new idea. Right, uh, well, it's like my mom would take me to, she was probably relaxing and just looking at stuff. For me, it was like that as well. I was, um, and I want to say my mom is, is, is a serious person, uh, you know, lawyer, uh, exe uh, business executive, uh, uh, um, realtor. She is, uh, has a PhD, or everything like that. But we would go shopping and uh, at the garage sales, and I would just look at a lot of old stuff, cloth, the color, the material of things, touching the stuff, seeing and understanding and learning about periods, about color associations to periods, like colors from the 60s versus colors from the 70s. And this is me doing this stuff in the you know, early 80s, late 70s, going to these kinds of places and just seeing like magazines with the color quality of those images and so forth so that I can look back at those magazines from decades and see how technology changes the way color is understood. And that's also very important for me to think about that sort of thing. Like for myself, I see my colors still coming from comic books, this four color notion, you know, this four color quality coming through in my paintings. But I'm also exploring other things and other aspects of from that and with the understanding that there's so many ways in which we can think of color existing in the world as it exists in the world. Do you think color has, uh the, the potential for color, color choice has expanded exponentially in say the last 30 years. I, I would say yes. I mean, I, I walk into a Lowe's and I see all those uh, painting uh, samples in the racks and I think there is, uh, it's like the cereal aisle in a gargantuan yeah. uh, uh, grocery store. It's almost terrifying, there's almost too much color. Um, it, it, that can exist and you can have, you're, you're, you're talking about my, language, you're just talking about information that we have, we can call it color, we can call it metal work, we can call it the, um, uh, the parts. I mean, I have this old uh, uh, like Makita drill that I've had forever and I'm thinking about like, wow, what would it be to go back to the 70s and look at the color of the tools, of the clamps, of the cables versus that what we got in the lows today. And that's also part of the way in which the shift of like say economics and, 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 and um, and uh, you know, social uh, uh, purchasing and all this sort of thing can come to be affected by the way in which people think, see things and the way in which those people that mastermind the way that people buy yeah. get the people to look at those things, to buy them in a certain kind of um, way, in a certain manner. Yeah, this, the science of color as an ocular experience, but also as an economic experience, yeah. Yeah. Um, has been perfected in a funny way, yeah. I think. Always. Um, and you're right, the, the experience of color in any given situation uh, from uh, the bunker that is Lowe's or Home Depot. Or the automobile. Are, are right, yeah. so many choices yeah. now. Um, uh, and, I, and I'm curious about how that has shaped the way you think about this work and if the work has changed in the last two decades as a result of all the expansion of these choices. Well, I'm engaging with technology all the time. The way, I mean, for, in my studio, if 
you know, my assistants will know this, I'm always going through these mixtures and different things that I'm dealing with in the color. I, my, in my own mind, I'm thinking about the way in which um, color might change through a given situation. There's this painting over here, um, you know, it's called Burning, and I'm thinking about, I was thinking about Matisse in as much as I was thinking about the transition of color from one state of being to another state of being. But I see the painting, I feel it's like light filtered through, let's say, a window, and how it changes from one situation to the other. I'm thinking about the psychology of a being, like say the bar in the center is a body, and maybe light is hitting that body on one hand, on one side, and then repos being repositioned or being re reconditioned as it passes through the body on the other side. So there's the psychological, uh, there is a cultural, I mean, the being is black. There is a sp space that this light is coming through, that's cutting through, this black space that that light's cutting through. And then there's this idea of maybe it's uh, so-called, maybe it's, it's not only social, but maybe there's a little bit of uh, uh, religion or, 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 or that kind of impetus in there. Maybe there's that sort of conditioning there. There's a certain kind of uh, filmic process that's happening in there, like let's say it could be pictorial, like I'm watching the transition of light in, in a, through a space as in a, as if I'm seeing it in a movie. Mm -hmm. So there's all these sorts of things that I'm always engaging in different ways in the work. Yeah. I, I've, I've often thought about the way you approach color to the way other painters approach color and odd odd combinations, mm -hmm. like the way Byron Kim thinks about color. Yeah, but, and I, 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 <laughs> that's good because I, I was looking recently at a, um, an announcement for a show he has up currently or maybe last month, and I've always been interested in Byron's color and the realism that exists in his color, for example, and the way he's, especially, especially now, the way he's engaging it. I feel like it just reconfirms this notion, this ever-expanding quality of realism that he's engaging with the, the color in those abstract paintings. Yeah, I agree, and I think that it ha the, the voca his vocabulary has expanded mm -hmm. um, into this realm of the science of color, mm -hmm. uh, where at first it almost was quite literally the physicality of color, the color of flesh. Yes. A, an investigation of this, this spectrum of color. Right. Um, and it, so it's a funny parallel to make, but I, th I see the trajectory of your two careers having, they, they weave uh, in and out of each other. Uh, you both really are colorists that think primarily about um, how color can be codified to talk about uh, this broad spectrum of things. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Byron's work and I've, I've loved it ever since I saw it in person uh, as an intern at the New Museum. Uh, in 90, 92 or 93, and he had the big Sinigdosh painting on the wall, and it was just like stunning to see it. And it was at the same time him and uh, Glenn Ligon were, you know, working together. They were showing together quite a bit, or their works were paired. And I was very interested in what Glenn, Glenn was doing, is the obviousness of the black and so forth, the spectralness of it. But you know, Byron's work really just the the. Uh, the notion of the color, the tactile, the realism, the realism as conceptual, all these different things really motivated me to really explore what he was doing a little bit more. Yeah. Well, I think the reason Byron came up for me is that when we were lighting this painting that we will actually edit into this talk at, at some point so that people will know what we're talking about. Um, but it's, it's, a, it, it's a painting that has uh, uh, large swaths of, of darkness in it. Mm -hmm. And then two, uh, when not lit, seemingly uh, similar uh, triangular red components. Mm -hmm. when we noticed immediately when we were lighting this painting that it was, it was really difficult to light because the darkness of the painting really absorbed the light immediately. Mm -hmm. And we were dumping very more, hard to more light onto yeah. it, and it, it was just drinking it up. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was happening simultaneously is that the two reds were differentiating exponentially every time we even just moved the light a fraction of an inch. Mm -hmm. And it started me thinking about the empiricism of the way these 
uh, paintings work. Right. We had to paint it three times to get that particular red to work in this way because I kept switching it back and forth and we turned it upside down to get, because I knew that I wanted one red, but then I had to change the other to get that right r rhythm, or to get that right vibration. And I just want to say also with the Glenn uh, Ligon and Byron Kim, it was really coming out of the point of identity politics and painting. And for me, the notion of identity in particular, obviously with Glenn, but in particular the subtleties, the nuance with, with Byron were, were very motivational factors. And that's what I want to say that still continues in this work, identity, but with this idea of working in the, within the history of painting in as much as wanting to go beyond its history into other worlds, other cultures, and bringing those aspects into the work as well. Well, let me talk to you a little bit about that part of the painting and how it may or may not have changed and or evolved uh, over the course of your career. Mm -hmm. Because I know that one way, uh, perhaps a simplified way of, that people tend to think about this painting is this uh, um, weaving together of two cultures, of African sensibilities about color and pattern and uh, the, the sensibilities of color and pattern that come from Western modernity. And I, and I know that it still enters the paintings probably a good deal. I'm curious if what your relationship to that idea is and how it has uh, ebbed and flowed. Well, I, I feel like, uh, you know, um, Western modernity is um, encapsulated in an African experience, in an African motif via Cubism. And then I feel that when I look and compare the Cubist space versus the Renaissance space, a Renaissance space, I feel that there's a certain literalism, let's say in both Renaissance and uh, Cubistic space, but I feel like with the Renaissance space, it's a, a little bit more illusionistic or illus illustrational. When we talk about one point perspective and how that phenomena that beautiful phenomenon of one point perspective is utilized to create this notion of a third dimension within a two dimensional space where you have, you know, the force of what our eyes see, seem to see being replicated in a two dimensional space, yeah. the science of it. And then I look at cubism and the beauty of cubism is that it becomes extremely present. And what I mean to say that the computer is like the closest thing, the, what, how we engage a computer is the closest thing to cubism, much less so to Renaissance per perspectival space, but much closer to cubistic structuring of space. In terms of pixelation, you mean? Or? In terms of the dialogue boxes, in terms of the information on this desktop, and how the information on this desktop becomes a kind of exploration of space of a different kind. And for me, that came to realization when I was looking at screensavers, the old-fashioned screensavers that we used to have in the early 90s, and seeing that sort of thing replicate dimensionality by just the explosion of things that we would see to so-called save, to save the screen from burning an image into it. Right. You know, the screensaver was just basically used to protect the screen, so whatever you were looking at, if you left it there for 24, 48, maybe a week long, to prevent your computer from that image being burnt into the... The color and pattern would move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the sense of looking at that and then thinking about the way in which the computer, we engage it with all these, you know, dot hypertext boxes, with all this information. You can think about your clutter of your own computer, let's say, my computer, let's say, with the, all the different icons of, of documents on it, and then a window for uh, uh, applications and the finder window, and then the, the Chrome window, and then the uh, uh, Word document window, and then Excel document, and I'm flipping through things and seeing that this kind of simplified notion of layering is creating space on top of the desktop image, you know? Right. So you have there, I think, my own opinion, the way in which it's depicted is like, wow, that's just like cubistic space. And then you think, oh, I can travel in, t in time. And I can travel in space with this machine, you know, zooming like we do today, uh, uh, instant messaging, right, and all of that stuff, which all really comes down. I mean, what the, the commonality there is that they are all primarily ocular experiences, and I, I'm curious if you think uh, 
the way we engage the world visually has it is but, evolved. But the, the ocular, the ocular for me is like um, this thing that transitions. It's not only like ocular is only like seeing because it's seeing and then thinking, right. and then seeing and then feeling, and then seeing and then imagining. Let's say so you can go through all these different transitional conditions of body and mind by simply looking. Looking is a sense, just like smelling is a sense. I smell, I get hungry if I'm hungry, I get hungrier. Uh, my stomach starts to rumble if I'm hungry and I'm smelling something. My eyes looking at a color can do something to the mind, something to the body. The physicality of a color can create a sensation that is whatever it might be. And right. that's what I want to engage, that possibility of all those different things that are not only physical, but are intellectual, that are conceptual, that are time-oriented, that are geographically based in time and memory. Like, oh, that color reminds me of the experience I had last week in this country, or anything. You know? it, so the ocular experience literally changing the way you think, and you, changing the way you think, changing the way you engage the world. Yeah, and it's in all paintings. If you look at paint, in all art, in fact, if you look at art and you're gauging what you're seeing, you're realizing that it's transformative. Right. Yeah. I, I had this conversation with Fred Tomaselli years and years ago, and he was describing to me uh, when he started becoming fascinated with the whole universe of, of the, the avian universe, uh, this idea of birds. And it quite literally was when somebody uh, loaned him a pair of binoculars and he, I think what he told me, this is not verbatim maybe, but what he told me that was that his experience with birds before looking through a pair of good binoculars was that they were sky dirt. And he, they just almost didn't exist in this way for him. And looking through these lenses suddenly changed the way he thought about uh, all of that and mm -hmm. it changed his work exponentially. It's interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, and I, I see that actually, the potential for that exists in all these paintings for me, mm -hmm. uh, post, <laughs> interestingly, post my experience with them at 72 DPI. Right. I literally had, as I said at the beginning of this talk, had to be in the room with them to get what they were. Right. Um, and I'll tell you the other revolutionary experience that just has happened, which is really getting us to the uh, wall painting that we're doing this talk in front of, is, uh, and there's no way that anyone is gonna see this. Maybe we'll try to find a way to photograph it, but there is a texture between these forms and colors that is as important to this painting as any other aspect of the painting. Mm -hmm. um, and there is actually a, an overspray, which was the last step right. in this painting, right. that um, changed it exponentially yet again. I remember walking in the, the next morning and thinking this, it, it didn't exist right. really until, for me, until this moment. Right. And it, it was about the, the slight textures and the relationships and colors and pattern and the process itself mm -hmm. coalescing. Mm -hmm. This thing didn't exist to, for me. I, I watched it come together for three weeks and it quite literally didn't exist for me until uh, about four days ago, right, right. which was really interesting for right. me. I mean, for me, when I hear that, I think about like, you know, very traditional old aspects of, you know, managing and crafting a work, crafting a painting, when you're saying, talking about the varnish coat, I'm thinking, yeah, there's the tradition of putting uh, varnish on top of uh, oil paint, let's say. This is a, uh, you know, acrylic latex wall paint. Uh, of the finest kind and um, but I'm thinking about like what you're saying about how varnish was used historically to try to bring colors out to bring the depth of color out and forward and that there is a reason for it it's not like oh painting has varnish painting has canvas it's everything we see and everything we understand that is there has a reason and has a history behind it and these things will change and they will have those histories that will go on to proclaim why those things are there there is a reason for canvas. There's a reason that the paintings, which were originally done on walls, moved on to stretchers. And the reasons that behind that are long and many. We don't have time for that, but it's like, we can talk about all those things. And those are the things, in fact, that I like to teach when I'm working with students because we have too much um, uh, unquestioned information. 
We don't question the things we learn. We don't ask why are we doing these things enough. And to actually ask those questions is not to like say destroy something, but in fact it's just to learn more deeply why the thing exists as it does and to maybe get a better sense of how we can communicate through this medium to know those things. So like um, these blacks in fact that are here behind me, there are like uh, I believe four or five, there are five different blacks in there, but I look yeah. at it and I'm like, wow, they kind of look alike. But I start to look really closely and I, re I see, oh my God, that's why that black is green, that black is brown or reddish, that black is, is a blue, this other black is a yellow. I might see all that and I realize that that kind of thing is also important for me because I go beyond, I try to go beyond this homogeneous notion of say what col color by word association. I don't want just to have us to say blue and red and yellow, but I want us to think about those kinds of specificities because that helps me and that helps my the understanding of me and the understanding of my place in the world when I say I don't want to look at a binary and think of the world as a binary and be forced to engage the world as a binary, but to know yeah, that there's spe right. specificity that exists. There, this is a very anti-binary painting. It's one of the things that I realized in that moment where the, everything that went into the painting had coalesced, the difference in these blacks and the difference in the periwinkles and the difference in the pinks mm -hmm. uh, kind of go on and on and on. So mm -hmm. there are, uh, how many, how many colors total in this? It is Maybe 36, 36. colors. Yeah. Um, and then, and the Jeff Jones, uh, who helped me install all of this along with your assistants, assistants were looking at this painting uh, as it was finished and kind of marveling at uh, um, all those juxtapositions of information. And mm -hmm. really what it became a, about, in a sense, was information. Mm -hmm. But there's also another layer of information in this painting that is political. And mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, maybe as a way to, to uh, as a coda on this yeah. conversation. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the title is um, Milk and Honey, uh, Who's Afraid of Red, White, and Blue? Who's Afraid of Red, Black, and Green? And we understand that red, black, uh, red, white, and blue could be associative to the United States, but also there are many cultures, countries that use red, white, and blue in their, in their flag colors, be it uh, European, uh, Latin America, so on and so forth. Then who's afraid of red, black, and green? Uh, they could quickly be understood in this, in this culture in the West as uh, colors for the Pan-African flag, but there are also colors that are uh, in Throughout, used throughout uh, Africa and in other places as well outside of the continent. So, and for me personally, red, um, black, and green is uh, the base for the Biafran flag uh, as a Nigerian uh, of a certain part of, uh, of the country and a certain culture. This could have been my flag, let's say. So the colors are personal in as much as they're taken into this whole macro space of being uh, very specifically political in a very specific way. And then I'm thinking about, you know, November, uh, January 6th, uh, 2021. Uh, uh, I'm thinking about uh, um, the tensions that we have right now. There's uh, a lot of uh, shootings and or potential bombings at HBCUs. Um, there was uh, the protests that happened uh, surrounding George